very much, um, Alexander Vladimirovich. Um, you asked me to say something about the role of ambassador today, but as you've already pointed out, it's a very long time since I was an ambassador. I was only an ambassador once, and that was in Moscow, and I may not only be hopelessly out of date, but I think maybe speaking from a rather narrow base of experience. Um, I did, I was very lucky, in my case, very lucky to end up in Moscow at that time, as you say, it was a very exciting time, and if uh, we could talk about that later in questions and answers, so, but I was very lucky in the whole of my career because I started off in a developing country, Indonesia, Sukarno, if anybody in the room remembers there was such a man, Sukarno was still in charge, and the trouble was, it was getting really bad. He threw out the Dutch while I was there. He started a war with the British not long after I left, and then he was overthrown in a rather bloody revolution. Something like 600,000 people were killed in Indonesia in the course of that. So that was my, my first, I loved Indonesia, and my first post. I never went back to Southeast Asia, I never went back to the developing world, and I was very glad that I started off with a picture, a feeling of a part of the world which, <coughs> grown up in Europe, grown up in England, I had no knowledge of before, and I think that's an important dimension, that's the first, first thing. Then I went on, um, well I'd done Russian at university, which is why of course they sent me to Indonesia, and then they uh, sent me to Poland on the grounds that all Slav languages do exactly the same, but if you know Russian, you know Polish, and that's, uh, which is not quite true, of course. Um, but then, then again, I was very lucky because it's a period which everybody's forgotten, the Poles themselves have forgotten, but it was 1959, 1960, 1961. It was shortly after Gomulka had come to power. And what people forget is that when Gabulka came to power, there was also a revolution. The, the uh, uh, collectivization was stopped. All the Soviet advisors were thrown out, starting with Rokossovsky, who was a very distinguished man and actually a Pole, uh, but he'd served with the Soviet army throughout the war. And Gabulka was determined to uh, assert a kind of what Western journalists would call it socialism already, socialism with the human face. And that was a very exciting period for me. I was 27, my wife was a diplomat, she was 22, and we had almost completely free access to people. We had Polish friends, we used to go on trips over the weekends, we knew people in the upper reaches of the journalistic world. We didn't know many party people, they kept away from foreigners, but we had a kind of access to people uh, in a communist country, which was not possible in any other communist country at that time. And it was a very exhilarating period. It was a period full of hope, which was then dispersed over the next 30 years. The hope was not immediately realized. And when I left Poland, my Polish friends who were liberals They were sort of communists, but not very good ones by Moscow standards. Um, they said, well, we've done what we can, but we will not be able to um, finally create the sort of Poland we want until our neighbors have changed. They always refer to the Russians as Sonshiji, their neighbors. And that turned out to be true, actually. Although Poles now believe that uh, uh, the changes were made by a combination of the Polish Pope and Boesa. Actually, it was when Gorbachev said, you can go your own way, that they started the negotiations, which in the end led to um, change in Poland, um, and they held elections, which, as I keep on reminding any poll I can find, they had sort of free elections in the summer of 1989, which took place, which everybody also now forgets, three months after the elections in Russia which were also sort of free. They were very remarkable political events. So that was exciting. Then I went back to London for a while, dealt with Eastern Europe. Then I went to Moscow in 1963, <coughs> and I was there until 66. And it's a characteristic of my career that when I go to Russia, the incumbent Secretary General is overthrown. So in 1964, while we were there, 
Khrushchev was overthrown, and in 1991, when we were there, Gorbachev was overthrown. Um, there's no, obviously, no causal link between these things, but it was an interesting coincidence. So I was in Russia, and one of the things which struck me then, and this is, I'm going to talk a bit about why I think diplomats are still necessary, but one of the reasons why they're still necessary is that unless you live in the place and talk to people and travel around, you don't get a feeling for what the facts mean. A lot of rubbish was written in the West about the Soviet Union by people who've never been there. Lots of very, very clever people in think tanks, in intelligence agencies, in the JIC, the Joint Intelligence Committee, were writing analyses of what going on in Russia. They had facts, many of which were wrong, but they were the only facts available. They had no feeling for what sort of a country it was. Um, and uh, an anecdote I tell from 1988, so things were already changing. There was a woman who later became a, uh, an assistant secretary of the State Department um, who had spent her career as an academic studying the Soviet strategy. And I met her in the summer of 1988, and she'd been to Moscow for the first time ever. And she was saying, I walked down Gorky Street, the main shopping street in Moscow, she said, I looked in the shop windows, and there was nothing in them, nothing in the shop windows, she said. What sort of a superpower is that? Well, she should have known throughout her career that there was a problem with consumer goods in the Soviet Union, which reflected something about the economic problems in the Soviet Union and such. Whole dimensions that if you went there, you could see, uh, were left out of the calculation. Um, so that was... Moscow, and we went to Italy, which was uh, very interesting and a uh, very enjoyable place to be. We had lots of small children. Then we went uh, back to London. I dealt with East-West relations, politico, military matters. And then for five years, I was dealing with the European Union. And I went to Washington, which, of course, was also extremely interesting because, again, I think particularly the English, the British, think that they understand the United States and they understand something about Americans because we speak the same language, we have the same historical traditions, we um, have the same legal system, more or less, and so forth. Uh, it's completely untrue. The Americans are just as foreign, if you're English, as the Russians are, I think. The, the, the uh, illusion, because they speak sort of the same language, that, uh, that we think in the same way, it's completely untrue, I think. I love America, but it's not like um, Surrey or the British home counties, the English home counties. So I went there, I then came back for four years and dealt mostly with economics and then I went off to Moscow at the time of the, of the Gorbachev revolution, the collapse of the Soviet Union, the first months of Yeltsin. We were in Moscow at the time of the coup. Uh, my wife, uh, without me knowing it, luckily, spent the night on the barricades out the White, outside the White House with Russian friends on the night of the shooting. Uh, but she didn't tell me beforehand. I was actually very proud of her afterwards, but I suppose if she had told me beforehand, I'd have had to tell her not to go, which would be a pity. Anyway, and then I came back and I worked for John Major and I did this job chairing this intelligence committee and then I left the public service. So, I mean, that was actually I, it was a very interesting, enjoyable career. Uh, whether I actually did anything of any value or not, I don't know, probably not very much, but it was a, it was a good way of earning a living, I thought. Um, it does seem to me, and this is where I, people will not agree with me, uh, it does seem to me that the essential job, if you narrow it down, the essential job of a diplomat or uh, an ambassador hasn't actually changed in spite of all the new technology, in spite of the telegrams and the, the internet and the video conferences and the telephone calls that great men make to one another. Um, because if you take away all the sort of glamour and all the rubbish about uh, smart receptions and uh, all that, special kinds of chocolate mint. Uh, what an ambassador is there for, and what ambassadors have always been there for, from well before the time of Ivan the Terrible, 
Ambassadors are there to pass messages, basically. They're there to pass messages from their government to that government and to pass those messages back to their own government. That is not as simple a proposition as it sounds because you have got to explain your government's message in a way that those guys will understand. And you've got to understand all the nuances of their reply. Why are they saying that? You need to be able to tell your government. They may be something that's either incomprehensible or very irritating, but they're doing it for a reason. And your people need to know what the reason is. And you can't do that unless you're there, unless you spend the day, the ambassador's just been telling me about his daily program, unless you spend all day running around talking to people and getting a feeling for what it is that these people what it, what is makes them tick. And um, so you have to understand their minds, you have to understand the politics, you have to understand why that government has chosen to pursue this policy, even if you think it doesn't make sense, even if, and this is even harder, and it's one of our problems in dealing with Russia, even if you think the pol policies that that government is pursuing are against their own interests, as you perceive them. We're always telling the Russians that the policies they pursue are not in the Russian interest. I may think that, but it's not for me to judge. It's for those people to judge what they think is in their interest. And you have to be able to explain that uh, back to your own people. You also have to understand your own government. Because uh, one of the experiences one has is you get instructions from London which make no sense at all. You're told to go and say things to those guys that you know are going to cause trouble and make no sense and not advance British interests in any way. And you can protest if you like, but you probably won't be listened to. And what you need to understand is why your government is behaving in a silly way. Because there are all sorts of things going on at home which you're not involved in because you're living 3,000 miles away. The domestic politics of one's own country which produces these apparently absurd instructions are in most ways more important than the foreign policy aspects of the thing uh, and uh, whether you like it or not your job as a diplomat is to take this absurd policy and explain it to those guys if you possibly can in a way that sounds convincing even if you don't agree with it. Um, now uh, I've been, I, I told the ambassador, I've been reading the memoirs of uh, Anatoly Dobrynin. Anatoly Dobrynin was the Soviet ambassador in Washington for 25 years, which is a very, very remarkable in itself to be anywhere for 25 years. When he went there, um, Khrushchev was the general secretary in Moscow and Kennedy was the president. When he left, Reagan was the president and Gorbachev was the general secretary. He had seven presidents and five general secretaries that he worked, as it were, between. He, I found it a fascinating book. I think it's a very well written book. For one thing, he talks but from the Soviet, from the Russian point of view, about all the events that concerned us, the Cuban Missile Crisis, the Vietnam War, the troubles in the Middle East, um, all that stuff. Uh, and, but he's talking about it from the Soviet point of view, but from a Soviet point of view which is very well judged. He's it's something that it would have been very useful if we'd been able to read his stuff at the time because we would have a better understanding of what was going on. He, um, he knew everybody. He knew everybody in Washington after 25 years, but he, he, he made sure that he, he'd go call on people, he'd go talk to people, uh, and um, uh, so he had a very wide range of acquaintance. And he got himself into the position, which is quite striking, because we British, we think we're very well introduced in Washington special relationship and all, right, all that. I don't think we have as good access as perhaps the Israeli ambassador does, but we have pretty good access. De Brenin was regularly being invited to parties uh, for the 80th birthday of some uh, eminent uh, 
US senator, where he was the only foreigner there. Now, you know how difficult it is to, to be on those sort of terms. That's an amazing performance. But equally important, and this is the point I made earlier, he was very well introduced in his own government. He knew all the people in Moscow. He was a member of the Central Committee, which helped, of course, but he was in the political establishment in Moscow, which meant that he could understand where these people were coming from as well. There were various aspects of Soviet policy which he disapproved of. He disapproved of the restriction on Jewish emigration, for example. He said, there's no point to it and it causes us a lot of unnecessary trouble in our dealings with the Americans. He couldn't, that was a domestic thing which was going on in Russia, he couldn't get it changed, so he had to try and explain it in the best way he could to the Americans, but uh, he could talk, he could also talk to Soviet leaders on things like that and listen to him. A consequence of that was that he was able to pass these messages I was talking about. He did it confidentially. He did it very often uh, direct to Gorico, the foreign minister. He used to go and call on his American interlocutors by himself. He didn't take anybody with him, no taker, and he'd write his own notes. Um, and the advantage of that, he said, was that people relax. If, if you're just by yourself, talking, they'll talk to you more. And another thing he said is, you want them to tell you things that you wouldn't otherwise know, and you, that won't work unless you tell them things that they want to know. There has to be, it's an exchange, it doesn't work otherwise, which means that he took risks. He said things which he was not instructed to say. He was sufficiently um, experienced and wise enough to know when he risked going a bit too far, and he, didn't, he obviously didn't get too far because he lasted 25 years. And the consequence of that was that at times like the Cuban Missile Crisis, the Vietnam War, uh, both sides trusted him to deliver messages, even unpleasant messages, accurately. They knew that if they said, you tell your government this, he would report it to Moscow accurately. Um, that um, requires a certain amount of courage as well as intelligence and knowledge and wisdom. Um, but uh, I unfortunately never met him, you probably did, but uh, um, he came back to Moscow just before I went out there the second time and he was in the Central Committee. And I have a slight impression from his memoir that working as an advisor in the Central Committee wasn't nearly as much fun as being the ambassador in Washington. And I have some sympathy. I found coming back here and working in Downing Street wasn't nearly as interesting as being an ambassador in Moscow. Anyway, he, uh, he's an example of a really outstanding public servant. He'd be, you know, we have them too. The Americans have somebody like Tom Pickering, who was ambassador in Moscow, um, who are in their own way great men. But they function effectively as diplomats because they're also their own men. They know when to take risks, when to push their luck, when to hold back. And uh, that seems to be it's what you need as an ambassador. If you only say what your government has told you to say, people will get bored with you and stop talking to you. Well, I talked earlier, right at the beginning, I touched on the question of technology and telephones and the internet and blogs and tweets and things that our ambassadors are now expected to do. Um, and there's a general feeling in the world outside that uh, you don't need diplomats anymore. That all uh, your head of government need to do is pick up the telephone and talk to his dear friend Vlad or Angela or Barack or whoever it is and they manage to sort, they don't need all these people. They'll sort this, sort it out together. Um, well, of course, that isn't actually what happens. Uh, firstly, uh, the British Prime Minister may think he's on first term, name terms with uh, Vladimir Vladimirovich, but of course he's not really. And one of our recent foreign secretaries made the huge mistake of going around India and talking to all the Indian politicians by their first names, which caused a scandal. You know, there are these cultural differences and you need to understand them, otherwise you won't be able to 
So that's the first thing that goes wrong. You ring up Angela and says, can't we sort out that, that, that Frenchman Hollande? And she may say yes or she may say no, but that's quite different from her doing anything about it. Um, so that's the first thing. The second thing is, even if they think they've agreed on something, they probably haven't got <coughs> difficult details. So they agree, and then we have to come along and find out what it was they thought they agreed, whether it made sense or not, and how we can turn it into an agreement which will last. Uh, and that we need diplomats for. One of the things which I found in Moscow was you go out to the airport to meet an incoming minister, prime minister or whoever it was, and all the way back in the motor car, the prime minister would say, what are people going to want from me? Well, What's he going to try and get out of me? How should I deal with him? You can't get that by picking up the telephone. You have to talk to the people. You have to know them over a period of time. So that's what diplomats are for. The other thing, of course, diplomats and foreign ministries are for is to know about foreign countries, speak the languages, know the history, know the culture, and therefore be in a position to give advice. One of the things that's happened here, I don't know whether it's true in the Russian foreign ministry or in your foreign <coughs> ministry, but one of the things that happened here is the importance of that kind of expertise has been diminished over the years. Uh, William Hague has just reopened the language school. I mean, there was a time when they weren't really teaching British diplomats foreign languages. Uh, when uh, they, the foreign office used to be organized into geographical departments for part of Russia, America, Thailand, or whatever, and they had a research card in view about those places. That was sort of abolished. It's come back again under Hague. I don't quite know what a foreign ministry is for, but if it isn't there to know about foreign countries, uh, and that's been, uh, I think, a, a misunderstanding that you don't need that sort of knowledge and that you don't have to listen to these guys. And of course, you saw what happened in the run up to the war on Iraq people who did know something about Iraq weren't listened to. Uh, a lot of hot air theory took over instead. I think I'm coming close to the end, but one of the questions I get asked quite a lot by people is whether their grandchildren should go into the Foreign Service. And of course, I'm a long way away from that generation, so I'm not sure how valuable my advice is. Um, well, I've got a son who's a diplomat, he's 42, and he's so he keeps me somewhat in touch. Um, I think that uh, one of the things which, uh, perhaps that's not true anymore, but people thought it was a glamorous life. Uh, you know, you'd go around to go to these parties, meet all these important people, and you live in foreign countries. Of course, it's not like that. It's actually very hard on families. And, um, um, you have to worry about finding somewhere to live when you get there. You have to worry about your children's education. Are you going to keep them with you? Are you going to send them to boarding school? If you keep them with you, are they going to be in decent schools? And then what happens when after two years you get somewhere else? You have to do it all over again. Nowadays, of course, your spouse has a career. Uh, when Jill and I married in Warsaw, and she was a foreign service officer, those days women were not allowed to remain in the service. If they got married, she had to give up her career. Later, she acquired various other careers, but uh, now that's not true. You have to manage two careers very often, and that's very difficult. And I don't know whether any of you saw a mini series on the BBC recently called Ambassadors. Well, if you didn't, I recommend it. It's coming out of it as a box, a box in the autumn. It's about um, a very small British embassy in the place which they choose to call Tajbekistan. And it's very like real life. It's full of incidents. The husband is quite a young ambassador. His wife is a distinguished cardiac surgeon, but she's in Tajbekistan, and she's offered a job in a London hospital. So what are we going to do about that? Halfway through, they get a Skype call from their daughter, who's 13. They're hoping she's going to come out to Tajbekistan for the half term. She rings up and said, I'm not coming out. I want to be with my friend. You don't think I'm going out to that place, do you? And turns the Skype off. Um, 
So it's not sort of as glamorous as people think. I found it, uh, I never found it boring, ever. I think, well, the whole, I was in the well, public service altogether 40 years, perhaps a year and a half I was born out of 40 years. I think that's quite, quite a good um, ratio. As I said, I think some of the things I did were moderately useful, although I don't exaggerate that. My son finds it interesting and worthwhile, and on the whole, the advice I give when I'm asked for it is that I think it's, it's worth a try. You need to know what the disadvantages are. I think that, uh, unlike when I joined, prestigious service, it has lost a lot of its prestige in the public mind, but it's still um, <coughs> interesting and worthwhile, and considering some of the other things you can do with your lives, a lot less boring. So that's my conclusion, really. That's the advice I give. Thank you.